been a been a great conference. You know, happy to be here. Happy to be able to. I mean, not close it off because obviously there's going to be a closing discussion afterwards. But at least uh, give the last hurrah for uh, paper presentations. Um, so if you haven't seen me before at the conference, my name is Aaron Hafficker. I'm from the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, I'm presenting some work that I did with Jonathan Morgan, who's also a researcher at the Wikimedia Foundation, who regretfully couldn't travel to Paris at this wonderful time of year to be in Paris. Uh, he seems to think that Seattle is pretty good and he's wrong. Um, so today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, the tea house in Wikipedia. Um, I love uh, having an agenda that has three things in it. So this one has three things, people like sets of three, consider that for your next presentation. So I want to talk to you about newcomers and entry barriers in Wikipedia generally. Um, the, Wikipedia has a newcomer problem, we're going to go over that a little bit, and then I want to show you a visualization to help us think about uh, different types of entry barriers that people run into in Wikipedia. Then I'll talk to you about the Tea House, which is a question and answer space that was developed specifically to help newcomers have a more welcoming experience in Wikipedia. And then finally, we'll talk about the experiment that we ran on top of the tea house and the effects that we were able to show on newcomer retention. Okay, so, uh, actually, I guess I'm starting with the tea house. This is my slide deck. <laughs> so what's the tea house? Well, the tea house is a wiki project run on English Wikipedia. It was developed in 2012 uh, by a, a few people at the WMF and a set of volunteers. Um, it was designed to reach out to newcomers with kind of a focus on making a more welcoming environment for women. Uh, the tea house, actually this notion of a tea house was a, a women focused space. There's a wonderful article on what tea houses were. And so they were kind of taking uh, inspiration from this idea of a tea house and bringing it to Wikipedia. Um, so the idea was to decrease intimidation and hopefully to increase newcomer retention. Um, and the reason that we were focused on this was because of a study that Stuart and I talked about in the keynote yesterday called The Rise and Decline of an Open Collaboration System. And I'm going to summarize it really quickly using this graph. This graph is showing you the number of active editors editing English Wikipedia over time, time on the x-axis, active editors on the y. I have this split into three different sections. So uh, between 2001 and 2004, Wikipedia was really small. And the, the infrastructure that sort of made Wikipedia work, I mean, there was MediaWiki, but then otherwise it was basically just people. You know, it was people who were looking at MediaWiki to vandal fight. It was people who were looking at MediaWiki in order to organize content. There were no real tools and algorithms in place. There just didn't need to be because it was that small. People kind of knew who each other were when somebody who was new showed up in the recent changes feed, people noticed that that person was new, where right now it's very difficult. But between 2004 and 2007, basically the world turned into a fire hose. And Wikipedia started to grow exponentially. In fact, I would like to point out that little blip there where the exponential growth dropped suddenly. That was because Jimmy Wales said, hey, 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 let's stop focusing so much on quantity and let's start focusing on quality. And somebody went and deleted a bunch of pages and you might expect what that happened to the editor population. If your page gets deleted, you might not like hanging out there. By the way, they actually did get restored. Um, still, that seemed to have an effect. Um, and then afterwards, we see this uh, decline period, this abrupt shift from a steady growth pattern, steady if not exponential growth pattern, to decline. And what happened is that as people were looking at uh, seeing their community turn into a fire hose and they were trying to deal with problems of vandalism and content quality, they turned to tools. And so the infrastructure of Wikipedia was not quite, it, we couldn't just describe it as people interacting with people on top of MediaWiki any, anymore. It was instead people interacting with algorithms and tools that helped them coordinate Wikipedia at scale. And that sort of describes what was going on during this decline period. Anyway, that was the conclusions of that rise and decline paper. You should still read it. There's a lot more into it. This is just kind of a, a brief overview of what's going on there. So essentially, a good way to think about how English Wikipedia functions, and actually quite a lot of the other uh, large encyclopedias, is that there's a barrier between the internet and uh, Wikipedia that filters content as it comes in that's made up of people who are looking at changes, but they're using algorithms in order to find the changes that are most likely damaging and make sure that they're removed. Huggle is one of the biggest uh, semi-automated vandal fighting tools. You can actually pull up a, it's a third party tool. It runs on your computer. You have to install it. It will load up diffs in Wikipedia that were recently saved and sort them by most likely damaging to least likely damaging so that you can find the 
most likely to be damaging at its first, and Kluvad is a bot that will automatically revert uh, edits that are likely to be damaging, but it has to have a really, really high confidence about those edits. So Klubot lets a lot of edits go by, Huggle then picks up the rest, and of course watch lists play a big role in this sort of stuff too. Um, so it actually took us a little while to figure out that this decline was happening. It, uh, there was a paper that was published in 2009 by Bob Wonsta et al. of Hello Toy Research Center. The singularity is not near the slowing growth of Wikipedia that was like, holy cow, we're declining, and it's not just that the population is, is generally going away, there's something going on with newcomers. Newcomers used to stick around in Wikipedia, and now they generally don't. What the heck? Um, and so this is, it, it took us until 2012 where we published the, uh, open collabor or the Rise and Decline of an Open Collaboration System paper where we could say that newcomers aren't leaving because they're bad or because they're running out of stuff to write about. They're leaving because, well, uh, they're not having a good user experience. They're being uh, hammered by these quality control tools, the quality control tools that I was talking about that it kind of represent this decline period. And so essentially, in its efforts to clean up Wikipedia, to focus on quality instead of quantity, Wikipedia ended up uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, almost literally, almost. Um, <laughs> Uh, so there's this notion that Wikipedia has become hard for newcomers uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, and so uh, this, this plot is really cool. Um, this, is, this is showing like the, on the, the, uh, the red area is the rise in warning templates that are sent to newcomers <laughs> over time. And the blue is the decrease in praise that's sent to newcomers over time. And you can see like this is 2007. So like you can kind of see what's going on as it plays out in the traces on Wikipedia. Um, so also around this time, there were the first studies that were coming out about the gender gap in Wikipedia. It turns out that only 16% of the active editors in Wikipedia uh, identify as not a man. Um, generally women, but gener or, but I'm really talking about not a man here. And so we knew that we had this kind of problem in Wikipedia, and we think that there is a relationship between uh, uh, having a bad newcomer experience for uh, people who are showing up on the site and having a low uh, or a very small proportion of women who are editing Wikipedia. Um, so there were a bunch of initiatives that came out after the publication of the Rise and Decline study. So this one in the upper left is, oh gosh, actually I forget what it's called, but it let newcomers share what their newcomer experience was like and have a Wikipedia and respond to them. Uh, in the lower left, uh, we, we were running uh, newcomer engagement campaigns where we were reaching out to newcomers and suggesting that they make certain types of edits, like rather than creating an article, maybe you should consider doing a copy edit because people will be less of a jerk to you if you do a copy edit rather than creating a new article. Um, we developed a visual editor, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. It's a WYSIWYG editor. Um, and we developed a few different spaces for supporting newcomers, such as the Adopt a User program, and there were wiki projects that were that called themselves the Welcoming Committee. So lots of different types of uh, strategies for engaging newcomers were coming out around this time. So in order to talk to you about what I think is going on here with barriers to editing Wikipedia, I want to talk to you about this thing that I call the new active editor funnel. So in order to do this, I'm going to use this visualization. This is sort of how I think about things in Wikipedia, is that uh, the internet's like kind of trying to get to Wikipedia, trying to see if it can contribute, if Wikipedia is the right place for them. Um, and they kind of have to pass this gauntlet on the way in of the kinds of uh, difficulties that they're going to run into along the way. Um, and I like to think about this in three chunks. Of course, this is just a lens. There aren't like three different types of barriers, but it's useful to think about it in threes. So I like to think about permission, literacy, and social motivation. And I want to talk to you about what I mean by these things. So permission would be, are you even allowed to click edit in the first place? The vast majority of articles can be edited. Even if you're anonymous, you can create, at least when we wrote this uh, uh, study, you could create articles as a new user in Wikipedia. Currently, you can't. You actually have to be around for a little while in order to create articles, and that's a shame. Totally different story. But generally, Wikipedia's permission model is super open. This isn't a really big barrier, and so it's generally not something that we have to worry about when it comes to newcomers uh, coming into Wikipedia. That's why Wikipedia is what it is. It's kind of the thing that makes it unique. Yeah, so anyone can edit. Uh, only trusted users can delete, so that's a barrier. Um, generally not an issue for newcomers. They're not showing up to delete things. They're usually showing up to create things. Sorry, delete articles, not yeah. delete text. 
Uh, right, right. Delete articles, not delete text. Um, because sometimes newcomers actually do show up to revert vandalism. That's a wonderful stigmatic pattern when people show up and they're like, hey, this article has something wrong. That might be their first edit. Um, so this is arguably a key to Wikipedia's success. Um, so moving forward in the barriers, the next one that I think is a really big concern is literacy. Do you understand what's going on in front of you? So do you know how to edit? It turns out that it's not very easy to edit wiki markup, and this is something that people were very concerned about. Do you know how to format the text in the page? Can you even read the formatting that's already there? Um, and more than that, do you kind of know what content belongs in Wikipedia? Are you familiar with what an encyclopedia generally is, at least in Western practice? You know, a lot of people who aren't part of the West may not be familiar with an encyclopedia in the first place. Um, and where do I go to get help or report a problem or say that somebody's harassing me? Not super clear. It's kind of hard to figure these sort of things out. So I want to talk to you about one literacy initiative, specifically the uh, visual editor, which is a WYSIWYG editor, what you see is what you get. Um, so back, back before the visual editor was deployed, essentially you had to edit this ugly wiki markup, which I'm really sorry you can't see very well here because the, I don't have enough pixels to show this to you. Um, but essentially you would edit this really hairy markup if you if you actually look this is the this is the top of the the article for biology there's no words there it's all markup as far as you can scroll and so this is a common thing when you go to edit an article it's like a page of markup and then the introductory paragraph starts um, so yeah what you see is a bunch of markup what you get is a Wikipedia article but in the visual editor land, when you click edit, you essentially see the Wikipedia article. You can see that this is the editor, this is the presentation. They're really actually quite close to each other. You don't even actually have to see the, the words to see that, you know, this is the first word in the article biology and this is the first word in the article biology. And so it's a much more straightforward process. Essentially, uh, this represents a significant technical literacy barrier. You've got to figure out what you're doing with markup in order to even get started. Kind of overwhelming. Um, you know, you'll ask yourself, like, what's the template? How do I bold? How do I split one paragraph into two? How do I add a citation? And what's all this curly bracket and bars nonsense? Um, whereas the visual editor minimizes this technical literacy barrier. It sort of gets it out of the way, bakes it into the interface. Um, so if you're familiar with Microsoft Word or Google Docs, then you'll be familiar with how this interface works. Most people are. Uh, literacy gets baked into the UI, which is super cool. So if you ask the question, how do I add a reference? Well, there's a button for that that opens this cool little dialogue that gives you a wizard where you can just add the things and it'll just put it into the article for you. And it'll actually do a bunch more than the wiki text editor. The citation adding tool in, in visual editor is super cool. You should check it out. Um, but there's other parts of literacy. It's not just the technical issues. You might ask yourself, like, who knows what WPBLP means? So I see two hands, <laughs> two hands in the entire room, which is, which is, and this is, this is OpenSim. We used to be called Wikisim. Imagine the average newcomer showing up on Wikipedia. Um, it turns out this, this stands for uh, the Policy on Biographies of Living Persons. turns out you can add content, uh, factual content to Wikipedia without a citation anywhere except for biographies of living persons because it's just too hazardous. There's too much libel that, that uh, can get added to Wikipedia. So they have a specific policy about people who are alive. You have to cite any factual statement that you make about them. Um, what about WP Prof? People should be able to guess this one. It turns out that there's specific notability criteria for academics in Wikipedia. You know, and then there's word soup for if you want to delete something in Wikipedia. You've got CSD, prod, and AFD. Uh, it turns out that if you like the criteria for speedy deletion, that's CSD. This is just the, the, the index. It's huge. This whole article, like all the reasons that you might speedy delete something and picking the right criteria, it's, it's a novel. And uh, proposing something for deletion, that's prod, um, which is also quite a novel if you go look at that article. And uh, AFD is actually a really interesting space. Uh, this is from Deutschland? Sorry? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, German Wikipedia likes to delete things. That's <laughs> inappropriate. <laughs> So, but, but what I'm showing you here is a structured discussion that people have about articles that they think might be, need to be deleted. And I want to dig into this uh, because these discussions are really cool. I just want to note that this is full of our uh, acronym soup. We've got BLP1E, N Sports, N Exists, BLP1E, BLP1E, no press coverage, BLP unreferenced, WP, CRIN, CRIN, N Exists. 
Like, this is word soup. If you show up on Wikipedia and you try to, you create an article and then it gets to this AFD process and you, you actually somehow find the discussion about your article that's about to be deleted, you gotta read a bunch of crap in order to make sense of any of this. Um, and uh, when you get there and you actually try and participate in the conversation, it turns out that's wiki text markup too. So you're probably gonna go, holy crap, what's these curly brackets and bars things? Um, so anyway, that represents a substantial barrier to newcomers entering Wikipedia. The next barrier that I wanna to talk to you about is social and motivational. Did you make any friends? Did you find the work rewarding? Um, do you identify with the community? Do you feel like these are your people? Um, and I think that's a big part of what we were running into with that rise and decline study. It's really hard to see this graph. It's uh, time versus uh, the likelihood that a good faith, like somebody who's uh, trying to be productive in Wikipedia, is gonna get hammered with a revert or a deletion. And we can see that there's a substantial jump in 2007. And I think the people's experience there is that, no, you don't feel valued when you show up in Wikipedia and these people really aren't your friends. Maybe you don't belong. Um, so I think that uh, generally when we look at the barriers in Wikipedia, it sort of looks like, looks like this. We have a very, very low permission barrier. There's a relatively high literacy barrier. And because of the way that we react to newcomers, we have this social motivational barrier. And they kind of stack up in a really interesting way. So when we develop something like VE, we're taking care of part of the technical literacy barrier, but we don't get very far because people still run into these, these uh, like process literacy barriers and the, the uh, social motivational barriers. And so when we ran studies on VE, it looked like it had absolutely no effect, despite the fact that in lab studies, people loved using this and they could perform tasks much easier. So we know it was removing technical barriers. So what we're looking at in the tea house is we're trying to remove the tip of uh, process literacy barriers. Uh, in a question and answer space, you can say, what's prod and how do I get involved in it? Can you help me? And the social uh, motivational barrier is where you might actually make some friends as you're working in this question and answer space. And if we're successful, then we can get a few more people pro going past this, this gauntlet and sticking around in Wikipedia. Okay, so the tea house approach is really interesting from an efficiency perspective. And I want to talk about that really briefly. So uh, traditional mentoring has uh, one mentor who mentors a set of people. And it turns out that you need uh, a lot of mentors when that mentor goes offline, then that set of people has nobody to interact with. They maybe need to find a new mentor. Maybe that one mentor isn't doing a very good job and there's no real oversight uh, to that situation. Whereas an open Q&A board kind of like takes mentors and mentees and it puts them into buckets. So that if this mentor disappears, then, well, there's still three mentors who are around who can answer questions. And so the cool thing about this is it sort of uh, puts people into queues. Like from a computer science perspective, this is a much more efficient, robust system than this. Um, so it, there was also a big focus on community building in the tea house. Uh, who here knows what the acronym RTFM means? So. <laughs> It, it, read the fucking manual. This fine, is a thing. Fine, fine manual. Uh, fine. Yeah, the fine manual, of course. Yeah. Um, so this is something that you run into in any sort of question and answer forum that doesn't have a strong community influence be, around being nice towards newcomers. Turns out newcomers ask the same questions over and over and over again. But in the tea house, they decided in advance that we're just going to answer them. Nobody's going to say, go read the manual, go use the search feature. They're going to say, welcome to Wikipedia. Thanks for your question. It's been asked a thousand times. Here is my best answer. Let me know if I can help. Um, so essentially, uh, the way that the tea house gets newcomers in the first place is by the use of a robot, a robot called Hostbot that takes the 6,000 newcomers that show up in Wikipedia every day and it tries to route the good faith newcomers, the ones who are trying to contribute productively to the tea house by sending them invitations and ignoring the vandals and letting them go get taken care of by uh, other mechanisms in Wikipedia. Um, so this is what the tea house uh, front page looks like. Um, you'll notice that there's a profile that actually shows a human being here. Uh, there's a big a link in the middle for asking a question. We um, when you ask questions, they show up on a forum. So here's one where somebody is asking a question about how they, they, they thought that their sandbox was private, but it turns out that somebody else went and made an edit there. And is this normal? Is this how it works? Um, so we also developed a cool little gadget so that you don't have to look at a big pile of markup when you have to ask a question. You can actually just have this nice little popover. So we tried to make it as easy as possible for newcomers to be able to at least get started with asking a question. Um, 
We also have profiles uh, that show uh, either a picture of yourself or a picture of something that you identify with. Right here, we're looking at profiles of newcomers. And uh, here's an example of profiles of the hosts in the tea house who are sort of the mentors, the people who are answering questions. You know, they'll tell a little bit about themselves and tell why they're in this space in the first place, like why they decided to show up. For example, here we can see the tea house seems like a wonderful initiative to me and I want to help it. I've been a new editor and I still remember it. Uh, so uh, on the upper left, this is what the invitations to the tea house look like. This is a, a invitation that was posted by Hostbot. And you'll notice one thing here. This actually has a signature from a real user, a host of the tea house, Doctree. And so essentially when they deployed Hostbot, they got the host to sign on to have their name show up in the invitations, even though the bot was making the posting. If you look at the very end of the posting in small text, it actually does say that Hostbot posted this so that the German Wikipedians don't get upset. Uh, uh, so, the tea house operates at a relatively high capacity, about 100 invitations are sent out through the bot a day, and uh, so we originally did this study, we actually did this experiment in 2015, so as of 2015 there were over 100,000 uh, invites that have been sent, usually about 12 questions are posted per day, um, and two to three answers per question, so people are generally getting answers to the questions that they post, people create profiles at about two per day. Uh, and there's usually about 15 to 20 hosts that are, per, that are participating on a consistent basis. Um, so there was some previous research on the tea house that was published in CCW in 2013 using a survey found that the vast majority of newcomers found that the experience of being in the tea house was uh, desirable and that the people who identified as female represented twice the proportion in the tea house as elsewhere in the encyclopedia. So it looked like at least women were showing up in the tea house more than they were other places in the encyclopedia. Um, and uh, they, in a non-controlled sort of way, they found that people who did participate in the, tea, in the tea house were more likely to make edits and stick around. But a big problem here is there was no clear control. Essentially, they were comparing people who decided to participate in the tea house to people who did not decide to participate in the tea house. And there's a strong propensity there. Um, so we didn't really know uh, if the self-selection bias was what was really driving what seemed like maybe an effect of the tea house or, or not. Um, and, and it was only a short-term retention analysis and one retention analysis that they performed there. So they weren't looking, they weren't looking at the scale of retention over time. Um, so in the current study, we sought to rectify that, to actually perform a controlled study so we could find out if there was a real effect of the tea house on newcomer retention and to look at retention a little bit more of a nuanced way. So our goal is to understand the long-term impact on new editor retention. The question is, do tea house invites, something that we can actually control, uh, have an effect? Um, because we can't control whether you show up in the tea house, but we can, tr we can control whether host bots sends the invitations. So uh, our sampling strategy was to uh, uh, target the editors who joined the tea house between October and uh, 2014, January of 2015. Uh, we ran this study for as long as we could. We really didn't want to actually have a control in place because we knew that the tea house worked, or well, we thought very strongly that the tea house worked. We didn't want to um, not have newcomers have the chance to go to the tea house. We actually iterated on the study design with the tea house hosts, and they didn't want to not invite good faith newcomers to the tea house. And so we settled on having a much larger uh, experimental group than our control group. And this, I, I believe this actually works out to 79% to 21%. Um, I can't remember why we decided on that exact percentage, but that's why the control group is so much smaller than the experimental group, because the host didn't want to deprive newcomers of going to the tea house. Essentially, we invited you or it put you into the control group if you uh, made at least five edits and you didn't get blocked. Um, that's essentially our criteria for you're probably good faith. You know, you made enough edits where somebody would block you if you were vandalizing Wikipedia. So essentially the way that it looks uh, like is this. Hostbot run, runs on a 24 hour cycle. And so we either picked you up about 24 to 48 hours after you registered your account. Turns out that 90% of new editors did not meet our criteria. That's primarily because a very large proportion of new editors don't make five edits. Um, a very small proportion of editors are blocked for vandalism, 
And so 10% of new editors get picked up by Hostbot. They get split into these experimental conditions where 79% of them randomly sampled get an invitation to the tea house. 21% of them get noted in our logs as not being sent an invitation to the tea house. And then we look at the retention of these editors uh, in a few different time spans. So we look at short-term retention, like did, were they editing three to four weeks after they registered? Were they editing one to two months after they registered? Were they editing two to six months after they registered? And so generally our hypothesis is that we'll see higher retention level in the, the people who had the invite to the tea house and then people who were not sent the invite to the tea house. Um, and so what we found is significance in two places. First, we saw that it was, it was much more likely in the experimental condition than in the control uh, that you would make at least one edit three to four weeks after you registered your account on Wikipedia. We also found that you were much more likely to make at least five edits two to six months after you registered your account on Wikipedia. And in these other groups, there was, it was always an increase for the tea house, but we only saw statistical significance in these two cases. Um, so there's no like weird strangeness here. We saw a consistent effect. These are just the places where we saw statistical significance. I'll ask after. Okay. Um, and so essentially what we're talking about uh, is on the scale of newcomer retention, we saw short-term increases of about 13% and long-term increases of about 16% uh, from receiving an invitation that looks like this. Uh, so. Uh, what do we think is going on here? Well, essentially, uh, we think that B's effect is getting a little bit of literacy, and the T house is able to get a, the other side of literacy, at least a little bit of the other side of literacy. It's able to help newcomers figure out what the heck prod and AFD is and participate effectively in those spaces. And it also helps with the social motivational barriers. And the reason why we see an increase in retention is because we're actually reducing a stream of barriers that allows people to actually be retained long term in Wikipedia. And someday, if we can actually reduce the literacy barriers more and reduce the social motivational barriers more, we might actually have something that looks like this. Not quite sure we're going to get there uh, anytime soon, but that's certainly the goal. So the next steps in looking at this is we don't quite know. We haven't demonstrated that the Tea House actually helps retain female editors more than it could be that the tea house actually only helps male editors and that re represents the increase in retention that we saw. It's difficult to uh, do the work to ask somebody, you know, do I identify as, as male? Do I identify as female or otherwise? Um, you know, we, we don't know if it helps build particular content areas. Wikipedia has known content coverage gaps and it'd be really interesting if we were retaining people who tend to work in those content coverage areas. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to explore the motivations of these editors, like is it helping to retain editors who showed up particularly to cover gaps, or maybe is it helping to retain editors who are motivated to uh, work on Wikipedia because they, they feel that it's really interesting to participate in a free project. Um, let's see. And so we want to do a follow-up analysis. We haven't been able to have time for it. We can certainly do a larger uh, sample and we can find out if the retention is actually statistically improving in that sort of like middle region where we weren't able to get statistical significance this time. Although it's hard to develop a control here. Like I said, the hosts don't like to do that. Um, and there's certainly a set of interaction effects that we'd like to compare here. Like does the tea house help you when you get reverted and get the kind of negative feedback that we were looking at in the um, the, uh, the rise and decline study. Um, and of course, mobile versus desktop editing because mobile is already, like there are more people reading Wikipedia through mobile devices than through desktop and that's been true since about 2013. All right, so that's all I've got for you. Thank you very much and I'll take your questions. All right, so I see Kevin and then I see Nikolai. Uh, so one one comment is um, even with a, a perfect intervention, not everyone's going to want to join. So right. so maybe getting up a little bit higher is as much as you could uh, get. The the really really nitpicky statistical question. Uh, so how many tests did you run to find a couple that were significant? Right. So we ran uh, forty. And 5% was significant. 12. No, no, it was 12? six. Six? Yeah, because it was one in five edits, and it was three different retention. Okay. 
And, and so we got, we got this. We, we didn't actually, I don't think that the paper actually has uh, any type of correction, but uh, we got this question from Wikipedians, and so we performed a post hoc correction that is documented on the, the white paper okay. um, and on the talk page, and we found that it was still statistically significant. Yeah, so same thing for the question about what you really measure. But inside of this and while well, you have those people who don't receive nothing, and those who receive an invitation, and you just test if these people react right. in average more to that. But among those, some of them have been to the tea house. And self-selected them to be right. to go to the tea house and to uh, involve, etc. Right. And that this population may increase the average of the global uh, invite invite list. So do you control from that? Or right. Do you so look just at those who receive the invitation but didn't go to the tea house to see if there is an uh, an effect and if it's positive? Right. So. Um, I don't think that we actually looked at that subgroup. I, I know that I intended to, but I can't, I can't tell you any results, so I probably didn't actually look at it. One of the things that I really want to experiment with is it's hard to set up the tea house. It's a, really, it's a really complicated thing. There's a big cultural push to having something that looks like the tea house, but on other wikis, they're still suffering from retention problems, and they have spaces that are kind of like newcomer help spaces. Maybe not the same as the tea house, but still valuable. And I would really like to experiment with sending invitations in those spaces so that we might be able to find out how much of this uh, is the effect of getting a nice invitation and how much of this is the place right. that you can see once you get there. Yep. Um, one other note that I want to give about like, does the, does the invitation versus actually having the tea house matter? Um, even if you get the invitation and you don't participate in the tea house, you might have gone there and looked at it. And I think that there is likely to be a big effect of just seeing like, wow, there's a space where people can ask newcomer questions. People respond to them really nicely. Maybe this is the kind of place that I can hang out and do my work. I don't think that participation is the, the whole effect of the tea house. I think just seeing the tea house is likely to have an effect. There, there, there. Oh, sorry. So Kevin, I pointed to you first. Oh, um, you can test that. Send people a warm, welcoming message that doesn't include the link to the tea house. Right. And actually, the other thing, if you're worried about the um, the size of the control group and people missing the treatment, then you uh, send them the message, but send it after a couple month delay so you can run the experiment. Right. We think that if if we send it after a couple months, no one's reading that. They've already they've already left Wikipedia. If you're if you're going to leave Wikipedia, you're going to leave in the first couple weeks, probably. Um, and so we think that the intervention has passed by the time that we're looking in the retention, or the intervention potential has passed by the time that we get to the retention right. period. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it then. Right, no, I think that it, that's a fair point. So um, my question was just to, to ask if you could help me understand a bit better the process by which you, you sort of assign people to the control group. Right. Maybe I understood it wrong, but is it, are they assigned because of their behavior in the first 48 hours? Right, so, so they're, they're not, uh, so they're assigned either the experimental or the control group. They're, they're assigned as a potential intervention candidate based on their uh, behavior in that first 24 to 48 hours. Okay, um, so, they all have, so they all have basically, the, you, you're, you're randomly selecting from a group that has similar right. behavior in the first 24 hours. Yeah, oh, so okay. this is the selection point based on behavior, and then this is random, just a shuffle between the two. Okay, and then, and then so, and so how are you, because you said that you weren't necessarily able to deny people the, the benefit of the tea house, that the organizers of that yeah, they, they didn't want us to, and that's why they wanted the control group to be small. Oh, so they didn't prevent you from having a control group, they just, they, you just right. kept it small. Okay, right, awesome. okay. which is arguably, we could have probably run the experiment for shorter if we had balanced groups, but that's a hard argument to make, and so we, we compromised, even though I don't think there's any statistical support for doing what we did, it at least is not statistically invalid. Cool, thank you. Hey, could you bring back the slides from the dairy in three different areas? Uh, yeah, actually, let's do the last one. There we go. The conditions, yeah. Kind of, uh, uh, having the least effect in sort of semi protection and protection of pages. Isn't this barrier a bit higher? Right, you know what, that's a good point. So in Wikipedia, almost all articles you can edit even anonymously, but there are articles that are super contentious. So like if you tried to go anonymously edit the Donald Trump article, or the George Bush article, or fun story, the elephant article, you can't. You have to be a registered user uh, working uh, in Wikipedia for at least 10 days and have made four edits. 
uh, to attain auto-confirmed status in order to edit those articles. There are some articles that are even fully protected where you have to be an administrator. Usually articles aren't fully protected for very long because usually it's when there's like some onslaught of vandalism. Like 4chan decided that they're gonna go make fun of Squidward and so the Squidward article gets you know locked for some period of time where only administrators can edit it. Um, most, most of these restrictions are the semi-protection where you have to register an account and be in good standing for a little while in order to do that. But this is super rare. And so that's why I still feel like the permission barrier is really, really low. But uh, this certainly does play out. There was a paper that was presented at OpenSim, was it last year? It was uh, reconsidering page protection by uh, Mako Hill and I think Aaron Shaw was also an author on that. And they showed that you can measure this effect. And that when you when you account for protection, you you can see some more consistent patterns in Wikipedia where we thought that things were inconsistent, like page views correlating with edits. Page views actually correlate with edits much better when you account for page protection. So it's definitely a thing. I just think that it's small enough that you can say that most of the barrier isn't in permission. Shall I take one more? Okay. Okay. Right, I think that's a good point. So the idea is that we should we should advertise the tea house more because it is super cool, and especially if we're trying to attract newcomers, we should highlight that the tea house exists. One of the major concerns of hosts in the tea house is that we get onslaughts of vandalism and trolls in the space that they're trying to keep for good newcomers uh, in the first place. We've been trying to reduce the criteria for even sending an invitation to somebody so that we can get to them sooner. Because I was saying that we think that the window is really in that first week, but really the most important part of that window is in that first 24 hours. That's really when people get their first negative reactions. And so we'd like, to, we'd like to push this up and maybe send them an invitation 10 hours after they register their account or something like that. And they don't, they don't want us to do that because vandals would show up. And I think that if we, if we publicize that the tea house is there for everybody on the homepage, we would get a bunch of vandals and trolls, or at least that's what the hosts think. Um, so instead, we've, we've done this strategy of targeting newcomers by sending out these invitations. And so you have to show up and do something. But just so long as you show up and do something, we can target you and make sure that you know that this exists. Um, we're, we're currently working right now to use the, the orders vandalism detection models to flip them upside down and use them to find good faith newcomers. And I think that we can show the tea house hosts that we can invite people way earlier and who have made way fewer edits uh, to the, the tea house while not bringing in vandals and trolls by using this modeling strategy. So we don't have to wait for you to make five edits and see if you got blocked as a vandal. Maybe we can see after two edits that you're almost certainly not a vandal and send you that invitation. And so I think that might help put more, pull more people in who aren't trolls. I have one small question. Or maybe I'll wait until you're No, okay. I'll go on Thank you. I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. Stay for a moment more. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, by the way, the recording of the talk of yesterday is online? Yes. Yeah, the recording. So if you missed the keynote yesterday, which is a really fun keynote that Stuart and I gave, it is now online. I've tweeted it, and uh, I, I will also help you find the link if you don't Twitter. Okay, this is another remark. So uh, if you gave a talk, please share or send uh, the link to your talk or your slides to Nicholas that we can put on the website. That would be great. So, oh, <laughs> this, this paper was not the, the, the last one by chance, but also because we have institutes a best paper award, which be given to or presented to you and to Matham for, for this paper evaluating the impact of Wikipedia. So you will receive I feel like it's in that time, as it is in the US. Right? <laughs> oh, yes. uh, but I think I have received this signature, so you should receive uh, the paper uh, later on. And this is closing this open sim or the 40th International Symposium on Open Collaboration. I would like to thank you all for your participation.
and for the presentation and the debate. I hope that you enjoyed the structure of OpenSIM and you liked the exchanges we had. And I gently invite you to come to OpenSIM 15, which will take, as I already said, take place in Treft, Treft, which is Sweden. We have one year to practice the name of the town. So what happened to the S and the K? Well, the people from Stockholm cannot make it, so don't feel. And um, if you want to talk with John, uh, he's here about uh, the community. And we are all looking forward to 